Take you a second to get my notes out here. Powerful ministry. 
from a hospital bed. You know, and it made me realize that I, that, man, I had no excuse for, for sitting back and, and waiting for God to drop on me something important to do. Uh, that there was plenty of work to do right now. And that's the other thing. We don't have to wait for it. It's here. It's around us. And God just is, is probably trying to get our attention. So we need to pray. We have his eyes, his ears, his sensitivity to what's going on around us so that we can minister in his name to those people around us. But anyway, we are to be known by our love. And this agape love is big. It's so much bigger than anything that we can think of. In Ephesians chapter 5, and I, I know I refer to this scripture often as well, but in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul wants to talk to us about how our walk should go. And he says, be imitators. Verse 1, he says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So we are to walk in this agape love. It's supposed to be something, and I, the reason why I wanted to get to this verse is it's supposed to be something that's with us all the time. It's not something reserved for Sunday. It's not something reserved for prayer time at night or in the morning. It's supposed to be something that goes with us all the time. Coming back to what Jesus said, they will know you are Christians by your love. By the way you treat people day to day, moment to moment, in business, out of business, uh, in social situations, how you treat people, how you treat each other. I don't know if you've ever been sitting, uh, standing in a, in, a, in a, or maybe doing some shopping, and you hear somebody uh, the, the, the row over rather loudly speaking about something negatively about their church or their pastor. I have. And I thought, wow, people hearing that. Or maybe you share with family members that aren't saved, you, they'll overhear a conversation about your frustration with something at church, and they're saying, yeah, those people are a bunch of hypocrites. You know, we've got to be very careful about our mouths and what we say and how we say it. And ask our, to God to guard our tongues and, and cause our, our witness to be consistent everywhere we go. So Ephesians says that we're to walk in love. He goes on down in verse 15. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. In other words, there's all sorts of things coming through every single place we go through the day to distract us from doing the right thing. To, to, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. The days are evil. We, Guard your time. Use it well. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And people saying, I want to know the will of God. Well, he tells us certain things that we need to be putting into practice to start with, or we'll never know the rest of it. You know, someone wants to know what the will of God is for where they work or where they go to school. Or, well, first we need to be practicing the things that we've already known that he's told us. Here's one. Don't get drunk with wine. That is debauchery. And the idea of getting drunk with wine, the way it's put here, is don't get drunk with the things of the world. Think of how easy it is to get caught up. If I only had the house, if I only had this car, if I only had, I'd be happy. What we need to find our rest in Christ is our happiness and our joy. He says, don't be filled, uh, don't drink wine for that, uh, be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, and that idea of submitting to one another there is meaning give preference to them, to other people around you. In other words, put them first, ahead of you. You know, even something simple. You've got a whole bunch of groceries and you're in the line and somebody comes up behind you and you've got a few things. Most people, you know, would be, I hope, this way. Oh, why don't you go ahead of me? You realize what that does to that person that day? That may make the, their whole day that somebody was that kind of polite to them. 
When a clerk, you can tell sometimes the clerks are having bad days, give them a word of encouragement. Say thank you and, and please and uh, appreciate you being here, especially in this time that we're in now. Thank you for being here and, and, and meeting our needs. Go out of your way. Go out of our way to find a re to look for, and again, that idea of having the eyes of Christ, the ears of Christ, to, to see and to hear what's going on around us in such a way that we can give those words of encouragement, not only to each other, but to other people that we don't even know. Today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 7, but I'm going to start with verse 4 just to keep it into context. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, and it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, or love never bears. There's different Bible translations, and I thought I'd read a couple of them the way they, they say it so that we can expand this just a little bit. In the New International Version, it says, love always protects. Now, the, the word was bears all things, but look at it says here, always protects. And you'll see why that's important, because it's tied to this word bears all things. Always trusts. Always hopes. Always preserves. So instead of saying in all things, it says always does this. And in either way is a correct way to, to say it. What it's getting at is that this is to be a constant way of our, of, of our walk. We are to, to be always in a sense of, of, of these things, protecting, trusting, hoping, and persevering. Love never gives, I like this one, love never gives up. In, in the place of it bears all things, the New Living Translation. Love never gives up, no, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Again, do you see the constancy that is supposed to be there? In the Phillips translation, love knows no limit to it, its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. That's in so many wedding messages. Uh, it is, it's probably where I've heard that combination of the words the most. And, and, it's, and it's good information for those getting married to hear. Uh, you know, love knows no limit to its endurance. No end to its trust. No fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. Love stands when all else Bears all things. There's two ideas in reference to the, the meaning of this word. One is that it endures all things. But since Paul uses a stronger word in just a little bit for the word endures, I think he's probably leveraging the second meaning here uh, for this word, which it hides, conceals, and covers. It protects. Okay, it hides, seals, and covers. It protects. Uh, it's used if it was in, if you if you were looking in in, in uh, uh, terms it's, it's it's used to to keep something out that you would uh, want to stay you know keep away from you something that would corrupt uh, it's it's used in a sense of of uh, a roof of a house protects you you know in the sense of, of, of from the rain uh, the uh, Uh, John MacArthur uh, wrote a, a, a quick thought on this. He said, genuine love does not gossip or listen to gossip, uh, even when a, a sin is certain. Uh, love tries to correct it in the least possible hurt and harm to the uh, guilty person. Love never uh, protects sin, but is anxious to protect the sinner. Isn't that an interesting thought? God's love is anxious to protect the sinner. Not the sin, but the sinner. 
Now, how do we normally put that? Love the person, but not the sin? Fallen human nature has the opposite inclination. There, there is a perverse pleasure in exposing someone's faults and failures. There's something about gossip that just makes it enticing. I know something you don't know. You know, and, and uh, hey, hey, let me tell you what happened to George. You won't believe it. You know, that accident up on, on uh, Street X. Yeah, it, yeah, with George, he'd been drinking. Couldn't wait to tell somebody, you know. It was, you know, you, you got something that you wanted to get, and, and it's to tear down. It's never to lift up at that point. Gossip. We like, like you said, like MacArthur said, perverse pleasure in exposing someone's faults. Man's depravity causes him to rejoice in the depravity of others. It is the depraved pleasure that sells magazines and newspapers uh, and, 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 and that cater to exposés, true confessions. Now, you think about it, you go, you go out of the store and what are those magazines on either side of the, 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 the way out on just before you get it to the counter itself? You have uh, Star and all the other, I can't think of the names of them right now, but, but they're all the tabloid newspapers. And right on the, the, the pictures in the car, you know we've got the latest juicy bad stuff to say about so-and-so. And it will be, it could be the president, it could be the, an actress, it could be an actor, it could be, it doesn't matter. We've got the latest gossip to talk about. And those magazines sell like crazy. It is the same sort of pleasure that makes children tattle on their brothers and sisters. There's only a few of you in here, got your attention. <laughs> Whether to feel self-righteous by exposing another sin or to enjoy that sin vicariously. We are all are tempted to take a certain kind of pleasure uh, in the sins of others. Love has no part in that. It does not expose or exploit, gloat or condemn. It bears all things. It does not, B-A-R-E, bear things. Okay, I thought that was a rather clever play on words besides. Um, you ever heard of the term prayer gossip? We get into a, 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 a Bible study and, and, and you have a prayer time and, and, and somebody says, oh, we need to pray for so-and-so. They, they've got a drinking problem. Or we need to pray for so-and-so. And it's and something that, that you didn't even know about. It. That isn't the place to expose someone's needs and sins. You know, uh, if, if you want to say that you have a you know someone who has a drinking problem and they lift them up in prayer, God knows who it is, so that, that is fun. But we get carried away with it. And there are people that I've been in situations where they, they can't wait to share in some kind of righteous way, if you will, somebody's sin. And you rarely have them expose their own. But they are anxious to expose someone else's. And so again, uh, I put in here, as uh, it, it's like a roof that's put in here to keep out the rain. Uh, it's like a ship that's built in such a way to keep out the water. Uh, this word protect, uh, this word bears all things. As to keep out something that would injure, corrupt you. Some, to injure or corrupt you. And again, put in here, no prayer gossip. Uh, the point, love doesn't point out or focus on the shortcomings of others but will give godly insight and discipline when necessary. We're not saying that there's not a godly stance about something. And it doesn't say that, that, that if you know someone who is in sin that you shouldn't go to them. Scripture's explicit about that. But that's not what we're, what, what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here is what was going on in Corinth. Everybody couldn't wait to talk about everybody. That's what the world does. We're not of the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We are of Christ. 
We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. You want to know what, you know, you know, it says we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Certainly that kind of stuff does. So love bears all things. Love believes all things. Now this idea of believe here means to have faith and trust. Okay, understand that. It looks for the best in people, willing to give the benefit of the doubt, with, but with discernment. In other words, you know, again, you know we, we don't, you see somebody walking the street and, 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 you, and you can tell that because, you know, they're, they're pushing their cart that automatically the assumption is they're homeless, you know, this type of thing. And for, for some people, as soon as they think of the term homeless, they think of, of scum. You know, somebody, you know, they don't know anything about that person. What they've been through, what's brought them to that point in their lives, what mistakes they've made, you know, it, 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 it have, the, the, the reaching out and touching them uh, is, is something that I would believe Jesus would do. I learned from my grandmother that, uh, you know, that desire to, to touch these people and to minister to them, to bring them a moment of a smile. My grandmother was, never drove. I've shared this before. She never drove. She fortunately, uh, you know, lived reasonably close to the, to the market that she liked to go to. And it was like, you know, people going to, there's an old time market, and, you know, she would never go to a Safeway or, and there, but down south were the Giordano's and, and the, the, the big, you know, so she'd never go to one of those. She always went to the same old market that had the bakery in the middle and, and, and uh, the, the, the meat market and all the different things around that you, you went in and you had to ask the butcher, you'd say, I want, I want four pounds of pork chops or I want this or I want that. You know, it was, and she had her little cart that she pulled and when she was at the store, she always bought extra food. And going home, because there was this one place she had to walk by where there were people sitting that were quote unquote hobos, that's what they were called back then. And she would stop and give them fruit or, or bread or, or something to eat. My, my one aunt was so, she, that was so embarrassing to her that her mother would do that. That she wouldn't go shopping with her. Now my aunt had an, an, an attitude about those people. They, they, they put themselves there. That's their problem. And, my, and she, to see her mother sitting there ministering to these people all the way down the street just bothered the heck out of her. I remember that one Thanksgiving. It was great. One Thanksgiving we had, my aunt's house was always the Thanksgiving house. She had the big dining room and the you know, you have this, and here was on the on the dining room table was the, the turkey and all the stuff around. Just a few minutes before it was time to have prayer and to eat, and that, at the side door, my grandmother is there. She goes to the side door. Again, if we're talking in context in the fifties, a hobo. He says, a piece of fruit, a piece of bread. She took, went outside, took him around, sat him at the picnic table in the backyard, came in the house, carved up a chunk of turkey, got mashed potatoes, gravy, all this kind of stuff. When, when my aunt came back into the bed, into the living room, uh, into the dining room, and saw everything that messed up, she, that perfect picture, Rockwell picture, dining thing had been messed up, and she was absolutely furious with her mom. Especially when she found out the hobo was sitting in the backyard. You see, my, I learned from my grandmother what it was to have that sense of compassion. But I also saw in my, my aunt the typical world reaction. Especially at that time in our, in our culture. Love looks for the best in people, willing to give the benefit of the doubt, with the, the, with the term. We're not to be gullible. We are to confront sin when we see it, offering help and support so that they too can have victory. 
Now, the context of the hobo, this type of thing, uh, the, the person in the street, uh, it's hard to get an opportunity. Sometimes you're ministering just in that context of, of a handout and, and, and ministering to their need. You may not have an ever influence, you may not be able to influence them for Christ. My, my, my son finds it interesting uh, in, in, as a, a waiver, the uh, people that live, leave small tips and, and pamphlets about Jesus. You know, most of the, 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 the waiters don't look at that as interesting. You know, and so, uh, you know, the, this idea of, of just how we are, how, how we look at things. Love believes in uh, the concept of innocent until proven guilty. It doesn't look for an opportunity to place blame. The characteristic has a twofold aspect to it. It takes God at his word. This idea of believes all things. We take God at his word. We believe it above all things. And love always looks for the best in others. We don't look for the opportunity to tear down. We look for the opportunity to lift up. We look for the opportunity to encourage. We don't look at the opportunity to tear down in the sense outside of the ears of that person. We, we look for the opportunity to build up. Our love hopes all things. And it's really pretty simple here. Love is not pessimistic. It is optimistic. Now, in the moments that we are in right here, and if we lived in more metropolitan areas, this COVID thing would be a far more intimidating thing than it is to us here. But just thinking about the times that we're living and the crazy things that are going on in politics and all the different things, we might, you know, the, the tendency might be to be a bit of a pessimist about what's going on around. Do you believe, well, I, I guess I, 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 I could put it more this way. Love has a Romans 8.28 attitude. Hope has a Romans 8.28 attitude. You know what Romans 8.28, anybody want to give it a shot from where you are? Romans 8.28, paraphrase. Okay. All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That's us in here, if you believe in Jesus Christ. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. If, that, if that's you, if you're a believer, then, then we believe all things work together for good. Does that mean COVID? It didn't say all things but disease. I have to tell you, I don't know how it's going to work for good, but and I know that the disease isn't a gift from God. Disease is the result of the fall. Gets down to being careful about ever saying I deserve. <laughs> because this is the kind of stuff, this is the world we deserve in a sense. You know, uh, but, but God, you know, he wants us to have an attitude of, of, of of being grateful in all things. That's part of this idea of hope. We, we have, what do we hope in? Well, first off, we know, hopefully, we know that we know that we know that we are saved. That we have eternal life. And that no matter what happens in this world, we can stand with Paul and say, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. While I'm in this world, I've got Christ, I can't lose. But if you take my life, world, disease, old age, whatever, if you take my life, I win. We are a people to have 
this great, amazing hope and should influence our daily lives. And that was what Paul was concerned about. He didn't see that with the Corinthians. He didn't see it being the, the influence over, the, uh, over them. He was concerned. Is this the, do you understand what this is? The hope that he has given us that comes through Jesus Christ. Hope believes in God's word. His will, his purpose shall be accomplished. Even when we can't see how, it's going to be accomplished. His purpose is going to be accomplished. And we can know that for certain. That's where our faith comes in. We hope in this. And so we should be optimists. People that look with anticipation of what God is going to do next. And then finally it says, love endures all things. In the general writing for Greek language, and I'm, again, you know I'm not a Greek scholar, but I, I use references to look these things up, and I, I, I found out that this uh, term here for endure is a, if it's used outside of the Bible, it's, it's a military term. Holding a vital position at all costs. Love holds a vital position at all costs. What is a vital position? Well, Romans 8, 28 is a vital position. <laughs> uh, that God is sovereign. That God is in control. The God that we trust in has got a plan. He will accomplish his purpose and it's going to be finished. And that even the work he has started in us, he's absolutely promising what? He will complete that work. And so we rest with an absolute confidence that he is going to bring about every, everything that's necessary to accomplish that. And our love endures all things. It can hang, we hang on to that love in the, in, it, uh, when, in the darkest moments. We can still hang on to it with confidence. As I was looking at this, I was thinking of all the martyrs through the history of the church. And then the one that struck me was, I don't know why, but uh, in my father's house, uh, the, the Cory Tin Boom story, and the story of her sister in, in, in the concentration camps. She was always looking for the opportunity to be positive. She died a horrific death. She lived under horrific circumstances. And yet she prayed for the guards. She prayed for the... She, it was the way God would want us to be. Corrie Tin Boom saw that and, and it bothered her because she couldn't bring it. To, she was confessing, I didn't have it for myself in a lot of those times. And then she finally got a chance to expose, the, to, to deal with that because in one of her, and most of you have probably heard this story, I see some nodding already, know where I'm going with it. As she's doing one of her presentations about... God and his love and his mercy and forgiveness and how important forgiveness is. Uh, some guy comes forward and was a prison guard from the concentration camp that she was in. And as soon as she saw his face, she recognized him. And he says, can you forgive me? She, and, and, and she said it was like God's melting over her and gave her the ability. She says, if, if it had been up to her, she right then and there, she would have said no. But the Holy Spirit in her says, be the grace of God, yes. Persecution. Through persecution, uh, the, the, the church hangs in there, endures all things. No matter the hardship, we will not retreat. The Holy Spirit will empower us, strengthen us to make the stand. Whatever we need, he will give us to take and make the stand at the point in time that it's needed. We might not have it right now because we don't need it right now. You're wondering, you might wonder and say, I don't know if I could do that. Well, 
with all confidence, if I believe in hope endures all things, and the hope of Christ is in me through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then I believe that if it comes to that point, God will give me whatever grace, whatever strength, whatever it is I need to be able to be the person he wants at that point in time. Philippians chapter 1, uh, starting around the 27th verse, there is this, a passage that talks about standing firm. And again, another military term. But the idea is to stand firm. The ground that you have hold, have taken in your life for Christ. Well, Christ has got, don't lose it. Don't take any steps backwards. Don't, don't allow things to come into your life that cause you to fade and move away from, from your, your faith. Or, or the strength of your faith. Be confident that God wants to see you through all things. And, 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 and don't let anything move you backwards. That's what it means to stand firm. And then here to endure. You know, stand firm and whatever comes your way, you can handle it. Through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit in us. I, I put in here that this love is enabled by the Holy Spirit to endure persecutions. Yeah, you know, in, in a, a patient and loving spirit. Again, thinking of, of Corrie ten Boom's sister. With no desire to retaliate. That's so hard for us. Or to reject, or to, you know, to condemn. It remains steadfast in the face of, and I put a blank in this area, fill in your own worst concern, you know, your own worst fear, in the face of whatever. Now, we can do this through the indwelling and power of the Holy Spirit God has given us. We have that ability to say, even in the midst of persecution, Father, forgive them. It doesn't come from a flesh. It comes from the cross. If anybody had rights and deserving things, I mean, yeah, he sacrificed it all. For us. And, and now he's telling us, with me in you, you can do all things. We can do all things through, through Christ Jesus and what strengthens us. Luke 17, 4. Well, I was going to look it up, but I, I'm, I'm just going to go to it in the sense of what it is. Luke 17, 4, talking about forgiveness and, you know, Paul, uh, Peter's thing was, how many times? Jesus, seven? What was Jesus' response? No, seven times 70. And again, you have, a, you have somebody like me, 490. And I, you know, so I, I keep my list until you hit 491. Now I don't have to forgive you anymore. But, but see, we've already read, love does not keep a list of wrongdoing. What did Jesus mean by seven times seventy? He meant as many times as necessary. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, a couple of verses that I'd like to share with you in, in the idea of closing. Uh, in chapter 2, uh, verse 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently patiently enduring evil. The idea of enduring here. Okay. Patiently enduring evil. In other words, even though there's evil around you, you, you endure it. You don't, you, don't, you don't get involved in hating or, or, or you know, you, you take care. Now, somebody will say, if I have the right to do something other than endure it, should I take advantage of that? It's not saying within the framework of your government not doing things that you can do, this type of thing. What it's saying is, is that when, when it's out of your control, when it's coming at you, take it on and endure it because Jesus Christ is with you. In 2 
In verse uh, 10 of that same chapter, uh, it, it, Paul wrote, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also might attain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We do everything for the sake of the elect. What he's basically saying is, for the sake of the witness that I leave behind, I do everything I can to leave a witness that will tell them I belong to Jesus. I think of the, of, 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 of the funeral that, that, that I went to of, of just a, a, a very special person in my life. And uh, some of you knew him, Randy Helton. Randy Helton was a, a person that came alongside, especially when my, my son died. And uh, there wasn't a day go by for probably two months that he didn't call or come by and check on me. Just to, you know, and, and pray with me. And to pray with Kathy if she were, were home. And uh, I remember when, going to his funeral and uh, just there was that opportunity for people to share. We had to they had to do the funeral at the uh, uh, river lodge because there was no church big enough to handle the people that were coming. And then there was standing room only, and people standing outside. They actually put speakers out in the parking lot. Um, and person after person after person standing and saying, "Never heard." Randy speak a bad word about anybody. But what a testimony. Now I'm not all into people saying, what is my epitaph going to say? But it's kind of interesting to think about sometimes. You know, what is the legacy I'm leaving to my family, to my community, to the people around me? This idea of endures, it says this, uh, I wrote down, that this characteristic of love never gives up on people. It never gives up on people. And I was thinking of yours and my congregation, a conversation earlier this morning about one particular person. Never gives up on people. And then, like I said, my grandmother, that was one of those people, she just didn't matter. Then it occurred to me, Randy up at, at, at Rescue Mission, talk about a guy who gives, and gets, and he never, he never gives up on trying to help. Sometimes they'll see the same person every, once a year for a couple of weeks, and, you know, and, and they're in rotation from someplace else, you know, and, and, and we used to call them the one-on-one nomads. Uh, and and, and he, he shares and gives and, and, and sacrifices for them. What a testimony. Love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, love always preserves. And the love we are talking about here is not Eros love, the personal excitement and, and erotic love. It's not the kind of love that attracts you to your partner or your spouse. This is a godly love, a godly love, the love that we are all called to have for one another as members of the body of Christ. And to love like this doesn't mean that everything will always work out the way you want. Love is often crushed, bruised, and rejected. Loving others is risky business and it will make you vulnerable, open to all sorts of pain and abuse. But it is the love that we are called to have for one another because it is the kind of love that Christ has for us. It is the kind of love that brought him to, his, to, to this earth even though he was despised, beaten, and rejected. It is the kind of love that held him to the cross even while those he came to save stood around, sneering and mocking and jeering. 
It is the kind of love that despite everything, cried out, Father, forgive. And as I read this, this came out of an article out of, the, out of one of the apps that I have on my computer. And, and uh, I thought about my pre-Christian walk and the number of times that I debated with Christians and, be, and, and, and was totally, I won't go into it, just the reality that I, I didn't speak anything of Christ and yet Christ was patient. If you told me in, in 1973 that I'd be 70 years old standing in a pulpit before King of California, I would have laughed for a long time. Because there's no way that could be possible. God's plans, His purposes, it's because He never gives up. He never stops. He keeps giving the opportunity. It is the love that we are called to have for one another because it is the kind of love that Christ has for us. It is the kind of love that brought him to this earth even though he was despised, beaten, and rejected. It is the kind of love that held him to the cross even while those he came to save stood around sneering and mocking and jeering. It is the kind of love that despite everything cried out, Father, forgive. And I read that again because it's the kind of love that we celebrate in communion. It's what he did for us. Love, agape love, Christian love, the love that we are called to have for one another is, uh, it, it, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. May God help us to become the loving people and the loving community he has called us to be. And I put amen. Uh, and uh, that article was written by a pastor by the name of Paul Green. And I, I uh, just thought it was appropriate to lead us into communion and close up uh, our message this morning. So I'd ask the worship uh, team to come up and, and sing the song. And uh, in your communion packets, if you uh, haven't got one, don't you, you know, feel free to go out and get one right now. But if you have it, go ahead and uh, get it ready to share in communion. The little plastic thing comes off first off the top, and then the, the, the lid over the, uh, over the top comes off. And uh, we'll share in just a minute.